I'm Ross Golden Bannon. I'm the moderator this evening. You're all very welcome to a plate full of food culture here at the Science Gallery. We have two very special guests here and basically what we are going to be doing is we're going to be deconstructing these dishes here which in fact appeared on the menu in the cafe today. It'll be the only time where it's not rude to pick at your food because <laughs> we're going to be picking away at every single detail of the items in those uh, dishes. And maybe just to start off I'll introduce you to our guests here. Uh, Claire Ann O'Keefe who you may recognise as a contestant, former contestant in Master Chef Ireland, but she's done a few other things since then ah, as well. Yes, yeah, I'm the consultant chef here in the Science Gallery. Um, that kind of means I create the main news that we have in the Science Gallery Cafe, and I also work a lot of the time with the Science Gallery staff here to create um, certain food events. And outside of my Science Gallery work, I'm also doing my Masters in Culinary Innovation at the moment. Excellent. And then our next guest is Nikki Twilly, who's uh, the science correspondent for The New Yorker. We were all really impressed yeah. with that. In fact, we wanted that job. <laughs> but you do lots of other things too as well, don't you? Yes. So I'm one of many science correspondents. The science <laughs> correspondent, I'd have to kill all the rest of them. Which I had to kill several people to get the job in the first place. I don't want to add to my tally. But, uh, but yes, I, f for the past five years, I've been writing a blog called Edible Geography, which is basically an excuse to write about all sorts of things uh, through the lens of food. So everything from what you eat in prison to the color of your urine. And then um, last summer, in, well, September really, I started a new project, which was launching a podcast called Gastropod, looks at food through the lens of science and history, and it's an episode every other week. So um, that's been my latest project. And you're doing something else that's pretty cool as well, no? Oh, I'm <laughs> literally cool. I am writing a book about refrigeration. But, um, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Sure>. yes. <laughs> OK. Um, and then maybe, uh, how did you two come up with, well, you've, been kind of, you've been kind of inspired by her Very much to so. create food like this. So maybe, how did that happen? Yeah, um, Nicola was coming over to talk to the students for um, our Ideas Translations Lab, run by Zach Denfield here, which is a collaboration between the Science Gallery and um, Trinity. And Nikki and I started kind of talking over email and Skype, and I looked a lot more in depth into her gastro pods and I was genuinely very much inspired by her gastropods and by our conversation that kind of brought me to create so some of you know we, we looked at different kind of topics but yeah it was very exciting for me because I spent a lot of time writing about food a lot about time now talking about food so to actually have someone who's going to make something <laughs> that I could eat it was for my lunch today that was thrilling that's great well then why did we kick off with the there was a beef pie pie if you like yeah a beef <laughs> pie chart, <laughs> yeah. uh, brisket, beef pie with, uh, and then you divided it up into a pie chart yeah. of the pastry, the vegetable, the meat. Maybe you could talk us through yeah. it. Yeah, so we kind of did for the special in our cafe today, we did kind of like a pie and mash canteen lunch, but we kind of made it a bit more innovative. So it's obviously slightly referencing life vlogging, which is our exhibit on it that's on at the moment, and that's all about collecting data and representing it. So the pie chart kind of represents um, what's inside it. So we've got you know, a darker bit for the beef, we've got a paler bit for the pastry, we've got green with spirulina, which everyone was very dubious about me using in the kitchen to make green pastry. Which is this now, though? Spirulina for the green um, triangle that you can see wedged there. So spirulina is an algae, mm -hmm. it's a blue-green algae. So I used that to colour the pastry with. And then we've got a turmeric flavoured little wedge, which kind of represents the, the spices there. And we used Irish beef and we used um, Pleasant Porter from Brown Paper Bag Project, which are an Irish craft brewery. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was kind of a take on a historical recipe. Nikki and I were kind of talking about kind of representing the provenance of Trinity itself and that kind of started us looking at historical recipes. So, what, did you come up with the recipe? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is why it's edible. <laughs> <laughs> Claire Ann tweaked a historic recipe. So it was a Hannah Glass yeah. recipe, right? Um, and Hannah Glass is? It's um, probably, well, you're, you're kind of saying she was, <laughs> <laughs> she was kind of the person who kind of came up with that kind of traditional pre-Victorian kind of food and 
codified it all in. So before Mrs. Beaton, there was Hannah Glass, and she wrote down these you know, brilliant recipes that actually work tremendously well for catering now, because it is kind of, it was, she was writing recipes for big houses, and it was mm. kind of like, take half the cow, you know, <laughs> cook it slowly, take off the beef, you know, put it in. She had funny things that the, Nikki and I found really funny that she had, you know, if you need to kind of make the pie go further, use fresh oysters, you know, stir them in, that'll, that'll help your beef go further. And, you know, my boss in the cafe was not really going to let me do that. So, but it, it, I ended up using oyster mushrooms in it, but it kind of brought up the subject that we talked where, which was about food that was kind of, uh, you know, it would have been... Luxurious food that has now changed yeah. into what it... Or, like or, what, the other way, yeah. or, the, or the other way around. Oh. So, um, food gentrification. Yeah. Food gentrification. Of. So, in fact, there's some interesting stories about uh, tuna fish. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, so tuna, uh, bluefin tuna is a luxury. Not only a luxury, it's, you, know, you shouldn't really eat it anymore because it's so endangered. Um, but what's interesting is, this is one of my... Uh, side findings from refrigeration research is that in Canada, where there was a lot of bluefin being uh, caught uh, in the 80s, it was being turned into cat food. The Canadians didn't want to eat it. Nasty, nasty fish, not very popular. They'd rather have something like cod. And so um, they were grinding up for cat food. And at the same time, there's a Japan Airlines executive um, who is in charge of cargo, and they're busy filling up all of their planes with all the Sony Walkmans that were very <laughs> hot right then. This is when Japan sort of ruled electronics. So all these expensive things coming in, nothing to bring back. The Canadians have got nothing. So he goes on a hunt, and he finds bluefin tuna, so much of it. And, and the, you know, the story uh, from a refrigeration point of view is how do you ship uh, bluefin tuna in such a state that it's still sushi grade when it gets to the other end. A lot of innovation going on there. They actually took some tips from a morgue. Um, <laughs> from a morgue? <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. If you flush it with uh, carbon monoxide, the flesh stays red. And one of the people on the team had worked in a morgue and saw that people who killed themselves that way with their car exhaust <laughs> had really nice red flesh still. So you never Don't know try you're going to learn anyway. something. <laughs> But it's an example of a food that went from suddenly from yeah. being from being completely undesirable, not even food for humans, to being the ultimate luxury, and now endangered and you can't eat it. So yeah. it was really, and it was really the start of sushi in the U.S. too. They started shipping it out and then thinking, well, if the Japanese are so fond of this, maybe there's something to it, and it starts picking so it was up. So in quite a short period of time yeah. that that, that, yeah. that has happened. And, you know, that's the sort of, that's the tie to oysters there, where they come, they, you know... Uh, a Sorry, is there oysters in this pie? There's, there's not in Hannah Glass's original recipe. Because they're just cheapskates here, is yeah. that <laughs> Well, no, also that we thought it would be nice to represent the food gentrification. <laughs> no, there's oyster mushrooms. Ah. In there. Conceptual oysters. Yeah, okay, conceptual okay, oysters. Okay. But it also, it brought off of a good talking okay. point. But the point being that at that, when Hannah Glass is talking, oysters were just... Cheap. Cheap. Cheap nobody chips, wants so to just, eat them. Nobody yeah. wants to eat them and they could bulk up your, your, yeah. your dish for you because the beef was more expensive. Exactly. Yeah, the beef was, you know, was the expensive thing okay. and oysters were kind of almost like, you know, like a scrap food and, you, you know, hmm. people were slightly dubious of some let's yeah. say. Okay, that's so it was interesting. interesting the way it was and used. I think the other thing that's interesting about this recipe is it sort of gives you a sense of, I mean, you can almost reconstruct not just what people were eating at the time, but... Uh, what was plentiful in nature at oh. the time. So it's a bit of like a recipe book ten, ends up being sort of an environmental history too in a way that you might not think of. So if you look at that, you can deduce from her recipe yeah. that oysters were really, really common, common enough to be cheap as chips. Mm. And then once they become, you know, once the coastal waters become polluted and mm. oysters become a bit thinner yeah. on the ground, mm -hmm. then um, you start getting them in more luxurious recipes. So you can really do sort of an environmental survey from mm. a historical recipe. And is the saffron as well? Is that authentic to the original recipe? Well, it was, it's not actually saffron that we, that we used. It's turmeric. Saffron okay. was, co was coming in a little bit after Hannah Glass. There was so what are the dates for Hannah Glass? Um, approximately. Um, it's not an exam. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling yeah. nervous now. Is this going to be one of my masters? <laughs> she, was, she was around about 1700s. Okay. That kind, okay. of, you know, that kind okay. of period. So there was trading happening. There was spices coming in. A lot of it was used for preserving. You'll also find in the same cookbook which is actually one we got from the archives here in uh, Trinity, you'll find people using 
cloves and spices mm. and things like that, you know, salt around it's that It's half time. medicinal, yeah. half mm. for flavor mm. at that point, and you know, because yeah. they have powers beyond, sure. which turns out to be totally true. Now they're saying turmeric is the best thing for preventing Alzheimer's, so okay. it's like... Yeah. Yeah, so that whole area around uh, spices, uh, uh, Cork has a very interesting history around that as a, the provisions capital of the British Empire, um, uh, the meat, and of course the, the, a hinterland, a very rich hinterland. Mm. So all the spices came from the empire to Cork and then was obviously used to preserve the meat and then was exported, which is why spiced beef is so popular in Cork. It, you know, so it's a unique product that is an expression of Ireland and empire. Very much though, specifically a cork. Uh, kind but of specifically thing, a yeah. cork thing that comes from and that. And pre-refrigeration. So the oh, taste, oh, the t I always think this is interesting. You don't think about your refrigerator as being something that changed the taste of your food, but actually it did because you didn't need fermentation and uh, all these spices and pickling and so on yeah. for preservation. So it's actually sort of tended us towards a blander diet and people are only just sort of rediscovering the joys of pickling everything and so on. Because oh, that would be a big argument uh, amongst restaurant critics and writers around, say, uh, chambray and cheese, for example. So we want our cheese to be chambrayed to r room temperature so we can get the full flavor. Uh -huh. But health inspectors want it kept in the fridge uh. to, for, th on their view, for health reasons. So that's, uh, and uh, in fact, I think up until maybe the 19, mid 1940s, a, quite a small percentage of people, certainly in the UK, actually had a refrigerator yeah. Yeah. and used sla cold slabs to store their food. Absolutely. So it wasn't common until the 50s and 60s. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's, which is really, really recent. And it has, uh, this is very sort of cutting edge science now, but it has actually changed. You know, you hear about the, the microbiomes, so the microbes living in your gut. Um, wow. They're saying that, you know, the, the FDA is now saying there's such a thing as the refrigerator microbiome, which is what you get when your food is so sanitized. Yeah. That and we're not you don't enough have the goods. exposure yeah. to, you know, no one wants to be getting food poisoning twice a week from, mm -hmm from, you know, yeah. microbes and whatnot, but it, we've gone the other direction yeah, with our refrigeration, yeah, yeah. which speaks to sort of that idea of bringing the cheese up. You can take some risks. Yeah. I think and it we're going to come back to yeah. cheese a bit later, later. aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, just maybe finally, just on the pie then. Yeah. Um, and the pie itself was, it was a way of preserving and carrying food and handing it I out? Think it I mean, it was, it was also a lot of the time part of that kind of idea of entertainment and feasting. And, you know, you could, I've, I've kind of tried to take that a little bit with, you know, I've, I've made it representative mm. of something. But around about the time of Hannah Glass, and the kind of she, was to, she was kind of writing for big households. Mm. You didn't have television, you, you didn't <laughs> really go out to a play, but you might have a big dinner and you might ha it was, you know, communal eating. There'd be okay. lots of big platters and dishes put down and they were sculpted and made beautiful oh, and yes, it was yes, created yeah. to be representative yeah. or to trick you yeah. a lot of the time yeah. you would have things that were meant mm -hmm. to look like one thing and, and, and turned it, it turned out to be another so it was a food was a form of entertainment especially uh, around her time and then often those pie, those pies or sculptures and things were disposable you didn't actually eat them at all yeah. they were just for for decoration you would find a lot of the time that you would have a salt dough would be made to make the base of your pie so the, the bit that looked lovely and was keeping all the meat juices in would be kind of an it would also season the food a little bit and then you'd have the top which might have intricate okay. kind of pastry on it and stuff it would be you know the mm. edible part of it i mean at, th at that time i mean we were eating you know the way that we eat now which is called um uh, a, la, a la russe starter main course dessert yeah. is a is a, a development of maybe the last 200 years whereas prior to that we were eating a se basically a series of banquets <laughs> that were brought to the table of of savory and sweet things so yeah. that and, and uh, that meant that maybe if you were up at the posh uh, and senior end of the table you'd get the better joints but if you were maybe at the less popular end of the table you wouldn't get those really really expensive joints yeah um and then the other thing i think and fresh vegetables were very rare on the table and it was quite rude not to pass them around the whole table yeah very much i, I mean it, they were they were actually kind of quite highly prized i think a lot of the time we think about it as you know, Henry VIII, everybody gnawing down mm. on a big kind of, you know, leg of lamb or something. But, you know, vegetables that were brought in, yeah, were considered, they were very much considered kind of like a, almost a seasoning to, you know, a lot of the dishes. Mm. And you might have, you know, kind of fancy gruel. And 
And also, like some parts were considered, uh, like, we might consider awful now, the opposite of the gentrification that we were talking about, you know, the, you know, the hearts and awful that maybe in our recent past we would have thought of as the, the poorer food were actually prized and put into dishes specifically and were presented, okay. you know, maybe to your most important It would guests. have a symbolic meaning too, yeah. I think. People, you know, saw it as sort of a prized part of the animal okay. central part. Okay. But one of the interesting things too is that, you know, pie and, and Hannah Glass is coming along just after um, cutlery has really made it uh, <laughs> <so> <laughs> that <laughs> that's something I hadn't thought about, but our first episode of Gastropod was all about cutlery, mm. and we looked at when did forks come in, and they're so much more recent than you think, mm. and you wonder what were people doing while they were stabbing things on the sharp end of their knife. Then yeah. um, they had hands, obviously you have yeah. hands, but um, but a, an actual fork, when it, you know, it's only coming in really about 100 years before Hannah Glass, yeah. and initially seen as this very, very suspect thing, sort of associated with the devil because of the whole pitchfork <laughs> business, um, and also very like European and... Um, Plus, yeah, it had started in Italy. Exactly. So really, it was quite unmanly for yeah, Northern exactly. European men to use a fork. <laughs> You know, you were a bit suspect if you had a really? fork. A bit, mm, really. Really, yeah. you know. Um, a bit light on your feet, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, um, but the Italians needed it for pasta, so it made perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's and actually an interesting uh, ch thing then happened because we had a culture in Europe, in the old world, of how we used knives and forks, but forks and knives arrived separately. So they weren't in popular usage um, in, across the board um, around the time of the, the Mayflower. So uh, the culture of cutlery in America grew up differently from in Europe. So if you watch um, polite Americans eat, you'll notice they do this strange thing of holding the knife and fork like this and then putting the cutlery down, yeah. swapping the cutlery <laughs> around and picking up the fork. And that's because their tradition of using cutlery grew up separately from our tradition of drink. Dr it's very funny that you should say this. So I grew up in England and my parents are English, but now I live in New York and I'm married to an American. And I do slip into the American cutlery <laughs> habit. And my parents' faces, when I've done that in front of them, they won't say anything, but you can see the horror. They're just like, it's worse than how my accent has gone. Like <laughs> I've definitely <laughs> learned something tonight. I always <laughs> wondered about that with my American oh, friends. Yeah. But what's curious about it is it's a much more complex way of eating yes. than the way we yeah. do it. It doesn't so make any sense. It's it you down. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> no. It's bizarre. But anyway. There's so many things about anyway, America. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we'll move on to the salad there, the yeah. subnatural salad, which sounds a little bit scary. Does. What's a, do you want to tell us a little bit about a subnatural yes. salad? Yes, so subnature is a term that um, started out as an architectural term for describing the kinds of nature that you get in cities, but that people don't really think of as the good kind of nature. So I'm talking about like puddles and mud and weeds and pigeons and like nasty urban nature as opposed to nice green natural nature and of course it's still nature but it sort of somehow there's a hierarchy so there's an architectural critic who came up with this term and sort of analyzed how you know sub natures that have been seen in cities and how people had tried to clear them out and things like that and um tom parker who's a professor of french culture at vassar read this term and thought, that's interesting. I wonder how it applies to food. So he sort of kidnapped the idea, imported it into food, and then hosted an entire subnatural culinary culture festival um, in North Carolina on the campus of Duke University, and invited people to sort of interpret what subnatural could mean, something that means puddles and pigeons. <laughs> what does that mean when you try to translate it to food? Which is quite an interesting question. Yeah. So Cla Claire Ann had her own take on that. I was, I was really inspired by Nikki's uh, podcast on it and kind of went off and did my own research and kind of had to think about it. I really like the idea of dust and the idea of something urban and you know, the food that's actually growing around us that we might ignore or the food that we might not naturally eat. So I came up with a salad that, although it sounds scary, I hope looks pretty. And um, this morning I was down by the canal picking wild garlic and um, dandelion leaves. 
and kind of put together a wild leaf salad. And um, also I've used in it from our own kitchen. When I was cooking, I kind of thought about the peelings of things that we might normally throw away. So I had potato skins that we tossed in really gorgeous olive oil and salt and toasted up. Um, you know, we took ribbons of carrot, put them in. Um, I put in seeds because although we now are all very health conscious, until recently they weren't necessarily something that we'd eat. And I kind of put it all together with a whey dressing. So, I mean, buttermilk is something that's very much part of Irish tradition, but we made a really nice salad dressing with it. And it's kind of a byproduct, really. It, it fits what, in. The, what's the point about the whey for you? So, whey, so me, to me, whey, like subnature, kind of almost represented that idea of otherness that you found in architecture and in art. And I like the way that, in, like, say, in Ireland and in Holland, buttermilk is prized and used. Mm. But I mean, I, I, if you tried to find buttermilk in Scotland where my dad's from, I mean, it would be really difficult to and find. And the US way is definitely, it's a waste product and it's yeah. also a huge environmental problem. The Greek yogurt boom yeah, has led to much. these like okay. lagoons of whey that they can't dispose of because it's so acidic. So, so okay. yeah, so whereas we, so whereas <laughs> in this culture we might use it, it's, it's, it would be subnatural to, to other people. To throw it away. Oh, right. I yeah. thought it was very subnatural. I, <laughs> I, I mean, what's, it's delicious. <laughs> what's the difference between something that's subnatural or just simply foraged? Is it because it's in an urban environment you would call it subnatural? Well, I think that's what makes subnature an interesting term, is not that we should sit here and be like, that's subnatural and yeah. that's not subnatural, because obviously it changes over time. One of the interesting examples Tom Parker told me is, in his own work, he's been looking into the history of the word terroir, you know, yeah. like the taste of place. Mm. And he, obviously now that's a very desirable quality and everyone wants to have that terroir for their wine and their cheese and everything. Mm. And, and yet, in the, um, in the 17th century in France, it was an insult. You would say, mm. ils sont du terroir. It was like, oh, he's like a little bit rural and um, like country bumpkin. Kinney, like, yeah. yeah. So it, and so his point was less that something is subnatural forever. It's more that it's a helpful, it's, he said, it's, uh, it's not a category, it's a strategy, which I like. It's a strategy for thinking about the hierarchy that we end up imposing yeah. on food, on nature, um, and the values that we're not necessarily thinking through that come with that. So rather than something being subnatural for our time, like, oh, nettles, they're always subnatural. Mm. No, it's more like, what is it about nettles that might make us see them one way at mm. one time and another way at another time? So in a way, it's the kind of things that in an urban environment, you might have walked past every day from beech leaves to mm. hobnuts and um, yeah. elderflowers that you'd like walk by every day. And then actually, if somebody draws it to your attention, you realize, actually, I can eat that. Yeah. Um, I think the parameters that you put on, you know, things sometimes the same way that, you know, we went into like, you know, from postmodern art into contemporary art, mm. you know, that kind of way. And we suddenly broke off into like lots of different, you know, kind of areas mm. and people may, you know, decided themselves, although they were part of the whole thing. Yes, I think it's part of foraging, but by putting the parameters on it and by, you know, reading a bit about the way that other people thought about some nature, it kind of made me put together potato peelings and you sure, know that's really what's really nice but nice about the potato peelings is like irish people will know that potato peelings were used to make pudding <laughs> so it's nice to see them in a more healthy <laughs> Health environment than salad. you, you have it, some pictures well, yeah of, i was um, going to say what was so interesting about what claire ann did i'm just going to scroll through um I, oh here we go well so this was what's so interesting about what claire ann did was and seeing how what subnatural turned into here is that it's this is what subnatural looks like. This is what this is what subnatural <laughs> looks like in North Carolina. So okay. it's a different thing in a yeah. different place. These are um, uh, pigeons healthy. being uh, roasted over um, uh, coals in a in a car park, <laughs> um, and then this is a she uh, uh, the bottom right there. That's a sturgeon. Coated in um, corn smut, wheat so lacoche. Like yeah. yeah. What's corn smut? Um, well, it's a delicacy in Mexico. Wheat lacoche. It's a it's a sort of fungus that grows on corn, oh. 
Okay. If you ever get a chance to, to have it, it's so delicious. <laughs> back what to the Hassa like? it would look. It it's would be dark. considered mould. It's mould. <laughs> yeah, it's black mould. Mold. If you saw it growing in your shower, you'd be like, I <laughs> ought to clean this. Um, ought to have cleaned it a while back. <laughs> you scrape it off the corn and... Do you know, I don't know how they harvest oh, okay. it. it okay. We, we need it, to look into that. I think it comes from the... It's not... It comes from the stalk. Of from the, the... Yeah. From on the, the leaves. On the leaves and the outside. And it's, it would kind of be considered wow. a blight. Yeah, but it's in a Mexico, fungus, it a is a delicacy. But it's a delicacy. Like truffles would okay. be. Okay. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And then... What else have you got here? Uh, so, and then on the top right is their smokehouse. So, for some things, they went quite literal, and smoke is was one of the architectural categories of subnature. So, they built a smokehouse. Smoking is quite, um, uh, you know, it's uh, I don't know that it's really subnatural in culinary terms. <laughs> it was quite interesting on the campus of Duke because, as it happens, <laughs> Duke University was built on tobacco money. So it's sort of an <laughs> odd reference to that. And, and it turned out to be in the smokers, the area that the smokers had used like previously. The yeah, would go like, and smoke. Yeah. So actually, they would come up and just sort of stand next to it and smoke. <laughs> <laughs> so sort of, it ended up being a sort of double smoke situation. <laughs> Plus, but plus, it's a it's a pres it's a way of preserving food before refrigeration. Yeah. Refrigeration, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, um, so I think, yeah, it w that was what was so interesting for me about subnature was just seeing that the the what subnature looks like in North Carolina is not at all the same as what sure. subnature yeah, looks definitely. like in Ireland, and that that's sort of the point. It's meant as a sort of a way of thinking about the judgments you're making, rather than oh. Now I have a new name for this. Okay, because I know, well, for example, nettles, we all like, nettles are a weed to us, really. Yeah. We're only now beginning to accept that maybe there's something a little bit more to nettles than yeah. a weed. Um, and I know the lovely, that lovely couple who own Wild About products and they collect wild, oh, yeah. you know, they, they do lots of chutneys. They do lovely chutneys and, and they, yeah. they have a beautiful nettle pesto mm. and to the horror of their neighboring farmers they are now growing <laughs> nettles in polytunnels which their neighboring farmers just can't get their the head around and actually re recent research would suggest that there's actually a, um, a natural viagra in uh, nettles, <laughs> nettles. so um, anyway yeah. we won't go into any further details <laughs> there's also probably a lot more nutrition i mean there, there's a, there was a study in the u.s um measuring sort of the wild relatives of of uh, fruits and vegetables and their sort of domesticated counterparts so you know rocket you can buy wild rocket or you can buy farmed rocket and there was something called nutrition dilution where by making it bigger and domesticating it and so on there, there was actually less nutrition yeah. in the sort of farm I think you can version. taste that as a chef. I, I mean, I know flavor it it's just, you know, it, may, it would make sense to me, that idea of dilution, because it just tastes that way. Well, that's been charted well, I think, yeah. by Jamie Oliver yeah. around the change in the nutritional density of chicken from the 1960s through to, to now. So I think mm. that's well documented across oh. a lot of foods. Um, the the other interesting thing I think you just on a on a local level if you like your drink Oshin Davis who's a mixologist here in Dublin in Dams and Diner yeah. he forages a lot of fruits um, wild fruits in an urban environment and then turns them into uh, ingredients for cocktails as well. Well, you can go into um, his bar and see like huge kind of vats with. You know, or with fruits that he's yeah. kind of he's preserving. I, well, it's funny because they use the fruit as well to make sorbets. Once That's they right. take yes, it out, do, from you get a flavoured yeah, alcohol. Yeah, yeah. The funny thing I like about that as well is that you know, often people are little. My husband's like this. He's very reluctant to have something that's been foraged from an urban environment because he thinks it's dirty. Yeah. And I think well, you're walking around breathing that in. I hate to break <laughs> it to you, but you're lo you know, if you're worried about that on your food, it's in your lungs and it's already yeah. you know. I think we discussed it with, with some of the students yeah. from, from Zach's class and about like, would you be nervous about eating it and it was funny the different kind of reactions that people had some people some of the students were kind of like yeah i would be and it you don't want to then kind of point out to them well it is isn't 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 there like not to be too graphic but isn't there a level uh, above which uh, certain <laughs> stuff can't be reached for if Creatures are relieving you, themselves. Yeah. There is a, a kind of a line. So, so sort of below that line, you don't really want to be picking Probably anything. Probably lots of nutrients but in there. Above, yeah. that, above that line, you can kind of pick away. I mean, I, I have to admit, I, when I was picking my dandelion leaves this morning, I tended to take them okay. from the walls okay. and things like that. And you like wash them, I presume, before you put them yeah. in the 
And <laughs> now we discuss this. Now, I yeah. had this for my lunch. <laughs> the, um, the, <laughs> the other interesting thing about, I think, the subnatural salad and those that, uh, that concept yeah. of collecting is the diversity within the one dish mm. that, um, and, you know, some people will complain that, oh, you know, you really can't get very, you know, it, it, you, you, you're not going to get very many dandelion leaves or you don't want too many or you want, you know, the, the uh, nettle leaves or whatever it is. And that um, it's the diversity, the rainbow of colour and flavours that on, th on the one hand, on the aesthetic level, delivers so much pleasure, yeah. but on a nutritional level, then delivers so much more as well, because you've got that diversity in there well, as well. I, uh, oh, I ha we had, so on our last but one episode of Gastropod, we had a guy, uh, Stephen Barstow, who specialises, he's known as Extreme Salad Man, um, <laughs> which, I mean, if you were going to be a superhero, would you not <laughs> choose that? Um, but he's, his most extreme salad had 537 oh different species in it wow. of just edible plants. And that is more, I think, different species of vegetable than I've ever eaten in my entire life. I mean, you go to the supermarket and try to count the vegetables, you wouldn't get, you'd get to 20. You're in, you know, you're lucky in your double, wow. double figures. So his, his sort of point about that is, you know, there are 7,000 uh, different uh, fruits and vegetables that humans ha have eaten over the course of our history, and now 60% of our calories come from four of them. So we should wow. we should be breaking out a little, you Just know. Just a little bit. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I hope it's kind of a nice salad, you know. <laughs> it was, it was, like if you, I would hope that someone could eat that, and it w I wouldn't have to be like it's a subnatural salad. Mm -hmm. The idea behind it, what it's beautiful, you know, was kind of to put the parameters on it. But you know, you also think when you're creating something like that I wouldn't continue down a line of kind of academic or scientific theory or artistic categorization to the detriment of what oh, it was of the taste of, of course, it I, I chose what you know I had garlicky flavors so I you know had a kind of a citrusy light dressing that you know you didn't want too many dandelion leaves in there you wanted the sweetness of the carrot the mm. crunch of the potatoes those things all went in there and worked I felt sure. completely well. I mean, I, and I think sometimes that can happen a little bit much with chefs that we can very much get caught up in whatever concept it is that we're trying to tell people. And, and really, like, cooking nearly every day professionally now has kind of changed me a bit and has made me realise that food is meant to be enjoyed. It's <laughs> interesting to look at. And it's a great kind of, you know, like Nikki was saying, it's a great prism. Food's a great way of looking at science and history and art sure, and sure. culture. But in the end, to, it's totally good yeah. to eat. It has to be delicious. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. all very well in theory, but how does it work in practice? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the other thing is maybe if we could have a little bit of a look at the, that central yeah. uh, piece mm. there. In fact, which is a really maybe a little bit of a riff of the, mm. the mouldy dust on the corn. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the idea behind that? Well, I mean, it, it, is, it is a take. You know, the smokehouse that they built in Duke University was a literal take from the architecture on Subnatural. And this was kind of my literal take on it. It's, it's dust. It's um, called Maltosec. It's a very molecular gastronomy kind of ingredient that's used in kind of quite high-end restaurants and what it does is it it soaks in oil so obviously i've presented this on a board i couldn't drizzle you know as i would might want to my foods with you know a lot of lovely herb infused oil that i had so i put the oil into the maltosec powder and it absorbs it in and the minute that you put it back in your mouth it melts back into oil okay. again it's um it's the it's the starch of cassava um, which is a, a tuber that's like potato, and it, it kind of takes it in uh, very well. It's you know it's it's a bit of kind of culinary no, no, sure, trickery. Sure. But, <laughs> but that's well, we have an interesting relationship with cassava here in Ireland, don't we? Because mm. um, in in Africa, cassava is a staple for a lot of in a lot of uh, African countries. Um, it's a kind of a worrying uh, item because it it fills children up. Um, it makes them feel satiated, but in fact, it's very nutritionally shallow. Um, and in fact, in, in, in Africa, and I think in Jamaica, yeah. um, the regular potato was called the Irish potato, yeah. and the cassava is called the potato. potato. Yeah. Um, but uh, the rather sad and curious thing, and certainly in some Eastern African countries, like uh, in Ru Rwanda, or sorry, Western uh, Rwanda and Eastern Congo, is that 
the local populations aren't aware that the leaves are actually very nutritionally dense and they discard them. I didn't know this and either. They, <laughs> yeah, say, yeah. And, they, and they eat the, the cassava and stuff. But what I didn't know was that the, the extract is used in very high-end culinary. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. it was interesting to me. I mean, it was interesting in a couple of ways. Like, one, to have, you know, you've got a Hannah Glass recipe on one side <laughs> of the plate, and then you've got this, like, unbelievably, like, molecular gastronomy thing right next to it. Yeah. And that's science and history. I mean, because that's what... Um, I think it's so yeah. interesting <laughs> doing gastropod. When you put these things together, you s suddenly get unexpected insights. And then the other thing is that I didn't know that was made from cassava. And in yeah. fact, um, d we w had an episode where we looked, we were looking at actually using microbes in ag agriculture, but the plant that we were looking at that with was cassava. Turns out Bill Gates calls it the stud of the vegetable world. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why? I had to look up a picture of it after that. I was like, yeah, you're like, is there something to see here? Um, I think it is because he's very enthusiastic about actually, it, it's, very, um, it's very well adapted for poor soils. Yeah, um, it does grow well. Really uh, variable climates. It does well in marginal areas. And so that for that reason, it's ended up being a staple food, which yeah. has its problems, but yeah. also... Sort of has it's a well, if it's used food. as a whole, if the right. whole plant is used, used, then you know, it's I think different. it's interesting to see the you know, the kind of the conflict with that that some yeah. people would be saying, yeah. plant this, it will grow in these Bill areas, Gates. yeah, Bill Gates, and he has a lot of money, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, well, I, ha I didn't really realize that you could, I certainly, d I've come across Cassava in Jamaica when I've been yeah, traveling yeah. there, but I didn't know you could eat the leaves, and I know, especially in Jamaica, people won't eat it because it's connected as a, a you know a poverty food a famine food yeah. that you know you can like nikki was kind of saying you can tell a lot about a culture by looking at the recipes they use and as you know the west indies becomes more americanized and you know more money comes in people want to leave that you know behind it, it seems poverty stricken to them so it's, it's it's an interesting way to look at so many different things mm. yeah well and, indeed the, the massive growth in dairy consumption in, in China and uh, Asia yeah. uh, is part of that drive towards a, a, a perception that dairy consumption is about um, prosperity yeah. and modernity. And so their diets are shifting over towards that. Um, Do you know, I looked into this a little actually because I was reporting about refrigeration <laughs> again <laughs> in China. And of course you need refrigeration, you know, for your fresh dairy. So it's a big part of that story. but. But it's it's so funny because yogurt is actually the the big you know the big um, dairy companies the Unilevers and whatnot yogurt they call it the yogurt strategy for Asia Asia because their plan is to get everyone eating yogurt as sort of the gateway to the rest of the dairy universe here you have a population that's like traditionally lactose intolerant so yogurt's a little easier to deal with so. And they market it in the weirdest way. It's all about your skin. So lots of teenage girls with beautiful skin holding like drinkable yeah. yogurts next to it as if okay. the two are connected in some related. way. And the other <laughs> worrying part of that, of course, is that Ireland is such a huge exporter of powdered infant uh, formula. Um, I think uh, we have 15% of the global market in infant formula. Really? So personally, I think there is a link between the fact that we have the lowest uptake of breastfeeding yes. in uh, Europe and I, I think there's a connection there but anyway um, but interestingly and I think you have written about this online um, in, in the uh, what about 3,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent mm. um, early humans were lactose intolerant but infants weren't that's, that's right unusual. yeah yeah I mean that's uh, the that's how humanity started out and um, you know it was really sort of an accident uh, that hu some sort of some demographics ended up being lactose tolerant as adults. It was a mutation that turned out to be useful. So the so goats and sheep, it would have been not cows, but bigger, harder to domesticate. But those those early um, animals in the Fertile Crescent, when they had just started agriculture and they're growing um, tasty grains that the goats and sheep also fancy having a little of and notice that um, they produce milk and they knew their own infants consumed it's milk, milk yeah. and so made that connection and um, and then 
made the cheese connection and through cheese gradually became lactose tolerant. Right, and right. it's that population spreading to Europe and also um, India that sort of carries that with it, whereas other parts of the world, not so much. So I'm not suggesting that there's this grand plan <laughs> to feed um, infants in China. There is, uh, but uh, There probably is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there probably is. It's a conspiracy. Uh, but um, maybe if we, will we move on to yeah. the other item there, uh, which is the potato cake? Um, it is a potato cake, isn't it? It is, it? But indeed, yeah. With, um, with seaweed. Yes. Maybe you tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I've, I've been kind of, you know, very interested in the kind of, we've had a certain interest in using seaweed in culinary ways um, here. Um, we've had chefs like Katie Sanderson, who's been using it a lot. There's been kind of people that are, you know, starting to think about farming seaweed in Ireland. And I mean, in the summer, I think it's June or July, Ballybunion's having a seaweed festival. Um, I hadn't used seaweed that much. I am... Um, I'm, you know, I'd made things like carrageen moss that when we were talking to Zach's students, I think one of them <laughs> knew what it was that I was talking about. But it's a, so just in case, it's a particularly Irish seaweed that you can use instead of gelatin. And um, I'd used it to make like kind of a fancy milk dessert that, you know, and that would have been the Irish kind of traditional use of seaweed. And I think I'd picked up from, you know, maybe a few other places that kind of Australian kind of Indonesian kind of cooking that you might put you know, a little bit of seaweed or kelp or something into your hot pots or stews. But actually for this, I used, um, I used dillisk and it was seaweed that we kind of soaked and put into the potato cake in the same way that you would make champ or a, I think Nikki was saying you <laughs> may have been yeah. like a leek or, you know, a, a cabbage that you would put in. But the seaweed worked so well. It was a bit salty. It's a bit umami. It mm. kind of gave a nice richness and roundness and probably more nutrition than you would get from, you know, some other ingredients. They're, so they're quite, uh, seaweeds are quite nutritionally uh, dense, actually. Is that, is seaweed big in New York? Uh, well they all the <laughs> chomping on it in New Yorker <laughs> offices? <laughs> we... It, it is being billed as the new kale, and kale <laughs> being as huge as it is, that means that uh, kelp has a bright future. But um, I think this was really interesting too, because we also, on Gastropod, we had an episode about seaweed, looking at seaweed, and some of the history, I mean, it has this very long history, especially in Ireland, yeah. um, but also in, in Asia, in Japan, it was legal to pay your taxes in seaweed. <laughs> um, that's how, you know, how valuable it was, sort of an alternate currency. And then the science of cultivating it so. and work around that. So um, it was actually the, the Japanese who first got started on that, um, working out how to make the, you know, the kelp reproduce, seeding it on these lines. I don't know if any of you have ever seen um, a kelp farm, for example. I hadn't. You sort of seed the spores onto, onto ropes, um, and then they just sort of hang beneath buoys in the water and the kelp just grows down from there. So it looks like a sort of a, a brown fuzz, and then it grows over the course of the winter. What's interesting is the scientist we interviewed about it um, is based in Connecticut, and he has sort of single-handedly started this yeah. kelp revolution um, in the northeast, uh, at least, of America. I don't know that the West Coast is on board yet. For, <laughs> for once, we're <laughs> ahead of the curve food-wise. But, um, but it, it serves a really interesting role because a, a lot of fishermen in the Northeast really suffering, um, you know, the catches are down. Kelp is something they can do in the winter. The work you have to do on it is January to March. So it, uh, and you put it in in November even. So it's something that they can keep their crew on in the winter. So jobs in these very yeah. um, depressed sort of seaside towns. It also, they're calling it 3D sea farming, so it, can, it goes <laughs> with your, like your lobster cages can be lower and then your kelp can be on top, so you're using the entire vertical column of the water. And then it, uh, it's amazing because it actually is, uh, it's absorbing all the runoff. So you know, when you put fertilizer on a field, if you put too much, you get terrible runoff um, of nitrogen and phosphorus, all these nutrients, and they lead to these algal blooms and everything dies, etc. cetera. And um, in, in the US, we get sort of the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, which is probably the size of several small European countries <laughs> every year, just an algal bloom. Um, so it's a real problem, but it turns out that that's what the kelp likes to eat. 
So they absorb all of that and turn it into then extremely Ta nutritious food. Transforms it into um, something nutritious. And what's amazing is he put one of his test sites, our scientist Charlie Arsh, put one of his test sites next to a sewage outflow in the East River in New York. And I'm here to tell you, New York City rivers <laughs> are not something that you would want to eat anything from. We still have a combined sewage system, which means when it rains, the sewage goes out untreated. It's uh, like okay. absolutely medieval. <laughs> So he put the kelp line right there. It grew. It was the, the right. normally grows to about nine, eight, nine feet. This was like 12 feet. <laughs> but he had it tested, and it didn't absorb any of the heavy metals yeah, and I PCBs think people are or all those sorts of things. Thing. It was absolutely, he was like, not only did it meet the FDA standards, it met the French standards, <laughs> <laughs> and, which are obviously, I mean, the FDA will let you eat anything, as we know, but... <laughs> But so it was, it's quite an interesting, um, you know, it has a lot of interesting potential both economically and environmentally. So then the question is, how do you get Americans to eat it? Because it's not a traditional food. No. So I'm just going to bring them your potato cake. <laughs> well, there's, um, I don't know if you got, you got your seaweed from um, Celtic sea, sea veg, yeah, is it? Yeah, Celtic They're sea veg. over in, um, help me out here, uh, well, Clare. <laughs> They're over in Clare. Um, no, I've been over myself and they have a fantastic operation there. Yeah. Um, and, but they are harvesting it from the wild, if you like. Mm. They have a... There's a rule in general foraging terms, if you do decide to go out foraging, that a, a rule of three, that like a third for you, a third for the animal, the other animals, and a third left behind to yeah, grow very much so. for the next season. So um, uh, they managed that very well over there. And they uh, actually, they had a very interesting dealings with the FDA because they had to send the water, water samples over because they were exporting to mm. Dean and DeLuca, I think, in really? New York. Yeah. And the F FDA rejected their water samples and they had to get them tested several other times. And the, they discovered in the end the reason they rejected them was because they didn't believe them because the water was so pure there. <laughs> <laughs> um, They'd never seen anything never like seen it. Because like it. <laughs> it's the Atlantic coast, you know? Yeah. So, um, but I use it a lot as a... They sell it dried. Yeah. In little sort of containers, you can buy it in bigger packets as well that you reconstitute. But um, uh, I, it's really lovely as a kind of um, a seasoning. Mm. Well, I mean, I put the dried seaweed straight into the kind of the buttery mash. Yeah. You know, I think people kind of sometimes reconstitute it, and I mean, I have to say, I've tried to give my dad a seaweed a salad with seaweed and things in it, and I, you know, I served it up. I was really excited. I'd kind of made sea urchin butter to go with his steak and I'm serving it with you know a seaweed mm. salad and he was like yeah the steak's fine I'm just you know <laughs> I'm it, having it, none of that I haven't none of that it, it was just that kind of I think it's it's the texture yeah. of it and I think you can bring people in I think putting it in a potato cake is a really nice way you crumble it like Ross was saying crumble it in dry and you kind of mash yeah. it up it will reconstitute in there and it it just has the you know a lovely kind of phosphorusy umami kind of you know well it taste. does have that that's is, isn't that salty. that classic the yeah. umami that yeah. that fifth flavor if yeah. you like that the japanese apparently discovered 120 years ago and then re, then recreated as msg um but it does have so it does have to add that sort of um, beefy, savoury flavour yeah. to things if you're really yearning after that, that kind of flavour. So um, I, I love it, actually. I have to What's say interesting is in the US, they've decided that Americans won't eat it dried. Um, oh. So they're ah. doing it fresh frozen for people in packs. So you buy it like you would buy some frozen spinach or something. It's just they've just like blanched it and ready mm. to serve like that. And they're thinking people will put it in smoothies. That's okay. the thinking. Oh, because of the kale, yeah. maybe, or some things. Yeah. Yeah. do anything if you could juice it. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> but <laughs> bullets have changed everybody's <laughs> breakfast. It is one of those curious <laughs> items in that it's, it's again, um, on, the, on the shoreline in, in Ireland, there's all that stuff that Irish people didn't eat for generations yeah. because of the famine history connected to yeah. shellfish and seashore and seaweed. And we're only returning to them now. And it's just interesting, you're talking about the, the below the kelp is the, the lobsters, mm. which used to be so plentiful, Canadian farmers used to plow them into the soil. I can't believe so, that. Yeah. And then we were back to what we were talking about earlier, about yeah. oy uh, oysters used just as a filler yeah. uh, in a beef. So it's interesting to see the cycle of, uh, of a food over time. Well, um, and the amazing 
amazing damage we did to our coastal waters as well. I mean, I think, uh, especially in the US, the story is that those things were so incredibly plentiful. And then they, I mean, oysters were, you know. The and what was the damage that was, that was done to the? I know. mean, the sewage outflow, okay. the dumping into the water. I mean, everything. I mean, uh, rivers were open sewers for a city. I mean, I'm sure Dublin was no different. You know, and the Thames was like disgusting in London. It's you, so uh, it became inedible and is, you know, t recovering that coastal water that we used as a dumping ground the richness that was lost is incredible. It's going to be difficult. Maybe we could move on and speak maybe a little bit, because you've, we've spoken about each item there, and maybe just maybe speak uh, conceptually a little bit around that and about yeah. um, the, using food as an educator, and in particular, you have some interesting things to say about um, Kelp having sex? You have pictures of kelp having sex? <laughs> I have, have yeah. I don't know. kale yeah. having sex. Do we, do we have a, a is the, audience the audience old enough no. to handle <laughs> this? And, and, and that uh, white camembert is a falsehood. Yes. yes. A falsehood. So do you want, will we start, start with the sex or finish with the sex? <laughs> I think we should start with the sex. So <laughs> go straight in there. Um, where is the sex? <laughs> there oh, yes. it is. So this is my co-host, <laughs> Cynthia, and she is recording kelp having sex. Um, so what they have to do, it, there's a scientific term for it, but really that's what's happening. We're in Char Charlie Arsh's lab in Stamford, Connecticut here. And what they have to do is they grab the reproductive organs off of kelp, they bring them back to the lab, put them in those beakers, and then that sort of metal um, thing that they're sitting on platform they make it move around, so they're recreating like the motion of the ocean to get the kelp <laughs> in the movie. Oh, that's what that was. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. oh, that was my movie. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. Insight. <laughs> I tried. You see, this is why I do radio. <laughs> um, and uh, and so and then they release all their spores, and um, and that's what they seed on the line. So this is sort of really the the action that is happening and um, because it's radio and you need you know the sound of kelp having sex on the <laughs> air um, that's what Cynthia is recording what, <laughs> what do they sound like uh, I mean they're not there's uh, <laughs> passionate cries <laughs> you know <laughs> Is no. it a bit the sound of the motion? It's the sound Please. of the motion. Yeah, I don't want to be okay. mean and science yeah. about it. It's that's radio. People are doing a little <laughs> filling okay. in in their okay. head. Okay. We sort of let them imagine okay. what kelp sex might sound like. Okay. We'll have a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We had a moment, pause afterwards. <laughs> oh. um, well, with that out of the way. <laughs> maybe the, the camembert. This is an interesting story, actually, about the camembert. Yeah. So, um, well, you were kind of. Yeah. Because we were looking at, or I used, I made canopies for the launch of Life Logging yeah, Lab that were pie chart canopies pies. Canopies for what? The, 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 start, the launch of Life Logging, which is our exhibit that's on um, here at the moment. It's all about data collection and then how you represent it. So part of my job here in the Science Gallery is to create themed canopies for the launch of things. So for the, the launch pie. of um, Life Logging, which is the exhibit, um, I did um, bar chart... Um, or bar graft, um, what was that? Like Irish pies that had like, um, there were Irish Irish stew pies. So they had the Irish stew and then they had orange layer for the carrot and then they had the uh, potato okay, and they looked like yeah. bar grafts. And we did mini versions of these, pie chart pies. Okay. Okay. But they, I mean, they are kind of cutesy, but they're also the idea of like, you can use foods to engage people. And so, you know, if you can eat something, you're kind of, you might kind of go, well, what's this about? They can be representative. They can also draw people in. And I think there's lots of ways that Nicola and I kind of discussed, um, you know, of especially, um, I think it was, I think the biome one I really liked, yeah. the idea of using cheese. I, when I was studying science, I remember kind of putting things in Petri, dishes and you know kind of looking at how microbes grew or you know looking at different spores and things and they actually do that with cheese yeah i think that's what we got i mean it's both excited as basically food is a way to talk about all sorts of interesting things yeah so you can make a pie chart and um, the the uh, one i got excited about was um 
<laughs> was cheese microbes. So this, this that we're looking at right here is a Stilton. The rind of a Stilton looks like outer space, it's isn't it? Um, this is a Comte, the rind of a Comte again, cheese. Um, and so this, this is from our most recent episode, which was all about cheese and which I thought was really interesting because, you know, often you're still talking about food for food's sake, but in this particular case, cheese is actually being used for science. Mm. So yeah, the cheese was kind of secondary to yeah, the Yeah, cheese just discovery. happens to be a useful yeah. sort of thing. So what happens is, I mean, we now know that microbes are really important. We know that the microbes in our gut are very important. We know the microbes in soil are very important. We know that, you know, all of this. But there's so many of them, <laughs> and we don't know how they work together. We don't even know how they, uh, how they interact, how they know the other ones are there. We can't grow most of them in the lab to even study them. It's a massive, it's a massive problem because they actually turn out to be sort of unbelievably important, and yet we really don't have sort of a handle on them. So we interviewed this scientist called Ben Wolf uh, at Tufts University, and he just outside Boston, and he had the insight that cheese rinds are like mini microbial ecosystems already. So it's like a, like a forest or the soil or your gut, but just in miniature. It's kind of contained. It's so contained. It's easier to it's look at. It's a model. Yeah. We, know, we know it because we, we know the conditions. We know how to grow it. We know what to yeah. look for. We know which molds are interacting. We've done the analysis on that. Mm. So he's actually using cheese rinds um, as a way to sort of explore how these microbes interact with each other. So what he'll do is he'll get, he'll isolate the different species off of the rinds, put them in a petri dish, which is not really a petri dish. He actually uses cheese exactly. curd in, in the, so he calls it an in, in vitro cheese. Which sounds also my cheese curds that different. I was using for my dressing, <laughs> he's totally also using. He's on it. Yours yeah. doesn't look like that. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> um, but he put, he'll put two in there together to see. It's sort of like a cage fight situation. Like, what, yeah. how do these interact? You know, they produce different chemicals in the presence of different microbes. And this kind of shows how we can then model from that. If we can understand how things are working like that in such a small way, we With can food. apply that to a forest or to yeah. the seashore or to huge okay. kind of areas. But then the, whole, then the other thing about that then, then is, I presume, that then over time, all micro -system, all systems change and grow over time. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So, you know, over several thousand years of human life, we have grown taller and all these other things. So is that the same with cheese then? It is. And actually, he's working on the future of cheese. He's like, oh, well, now that I understand the microbes that go in, maybe I could swap some out. So he's introducing new microbes for new flavors. But what he also told me and what we're looking at a picture of right now is an interesting example of cheese evolution. So what happened is this, this bluey green that you're looking at, rather attractive, was the original color of camembert. So you think of camembert as white, I did anyway. Yeah. Um, and that's not the case. This is penicillium cam camemberti. Okay. <laughs> like this is what it is. And, um, and it was originally this color. And what's so interesting is that, and camembert, originally made in, in Normandy and, you know, by the farmer's wives um, was this blue. In the literature you read, people say, oh, it's blue, it's blue-green, it's sort of a greeny-gray sometimes people They were kind of preserving it. the excess milk and kind of, you know, going, well, that seems an okay, yeah. you know, blue just, <laughs> yeah. just a farmhouse cheese. <laughs> and then what happens is you get... Um, this, this particular microbe will spontaneously occasionally mutate and throw up a white version. Um, so that would happen and they would get white spots on them or sometimes an entirely white one, which was seen as the odd one out. But as the railway system develops in France at the end of the, uh, end of the 19th century and as these cheese start leaving their little community where people know them, and they start going to Paris where the cosmopolitan um, okay. people are eating, eating them yeah. and are wondering where they come from, um, not knowing. And at the same time, you get Louis Pasteur and the beginning of germ theory and people suddenly... <gasps> It, they look at the world around them and they're seeing all these tiny little dangers <laughs> that are invisible. <laughs> oh my God, shock horror. It's terrifying. You know, Louis yeah, Pasteur okay, comes okay. along and suddenly, like, you can't see it, but it's killing you. And, um, and so at that point, the people start thinking, oh, the white ones 
they look cleaner. They're, <laughs> they're pure somehow. Maybe they haven't got the nasty microbes. So it's the microbes. same selection that we find with our fruits and vegetables It's nowadays. totally got selected yeah. for. Okay, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Over so a period of 30 years, the blue-green ones disappeared. Disappeared, and now we have the white one. Yep. So, in fact, not unlike the, what happened to humans in the Fertile Crescent. Exactly. Um, <laughs> It's all selection. It's all <laughs> scary stuff. I know. Okay. Well, um, well, that's what's so interesting about food. It ends up telling you so much about what we want because mm -hmm. we've made it that way. Right, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, we, I think we have a little bit of time for some questions from the audience if you had any questions. Or indeed, we'll take heckling as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you want to heckle. You can tell us where we're going wrong. <laughs> Tips for next time. And I think we have a couple of mics as well. So yeah. there we go, some mics there. So any questions there? Do you want to pop your hand up? There's one over here. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for your uh, interview. I have a question. You say culture is important. Desification also has food. But today you have many competition in food. Many people do it. You have many. <laughs> TV show about it, yeah. and how is it important for you the creativity in your recipe, and how do you how do you do to find innovation and creativity when you cook? Um, or is it important for you? Uh, yeah. I, where do you? I, I suspect that accent is not from Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> from Britain. Um, I mean, I think this is probably quite a good example of where you do find the creativity in cooking. Um, I probably had certain ideas when the Science Gallery first asked me, would I like to you know, work on this project? And I was like, oh, I'll do this and do that about Irish food and what are you know, the Irish trends that are here at the moment. But your ideas change by you know, the people that you deal with. And um, it was Nikki and I kind of having conversations about me putting parameters. I'm a great advocate of the idea if you limit yourself in, in any way, there's so much, yeah, you're right, there are so many cooking programs and there's so much choice and there's so much of everything out there. So I, I don't feel there's anything wrong with some of the trends. Yeah, if you want to make it from 10 miles around where you are, if you want to look at a certain country's cuisine, if you want to look at a subnatural kind of idea, these things are great. And it, I think that kind of limiting and putting parameters kind of almost forces you into creativity. And I, I find that um, kind of a good way. It, it can be anything. I mean, you've got books yeah. nowadays that are about budget cooking. Jack Monroe is a great one yeah. that's kind of, you know, she learned to cook on a very low budget and she could get brilliant recipes that came out from that. So I think, yeah, sometimes limiting is the best way. It's even true with the podcast. We deliberately said science and history and half and half per episode. And that forces it, it keeps you on track. When you take a topic like cheese, which is our last episode, I mean, you could talk, I mean, cheese, you, there's literally no end to the things that have been written and said and thought about cheese. Yeah. You go forever. <laughs> so having to make it a science thing and a history thing, it gives you, it gives you structure yeah, kind yeah. Of, yeah. to be creative within. It's interesting that uh, there, there was an interesting bit of research done by Sainsbury's a number of years ago around their organic offering, and they found uh, they've, there was a response from a woman who said she only ever bought organic in Sainsbury's, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, great, great, great!" And they drilled down through all her answers, and at the end, they discovered that she had no loyalty to organic food at all. But because there was such a huge diversity of stuff on offer, <laughs> it was a way of cutting out everything <laughs> that she couldn't make a decision on, and she just go, "Oh yeah, well, I'll just get the organic." Yeah. So, <laughs> so actually, by giving yourself a frame, it, it it can be really, really helpful in making decisions about creativity as well. Yeah. Are there any any other questions there? Or heckles. Oh, we've got one over here. And then we have another one here, this lady here with the glass. I was just wondering if you can still get the dishes or if today was the other <laughs> <one>. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we, I mean, we're going to serve um, the dishes tomorrow for lunch. We're kind of changing them a little bit. I think tomorrow we're going to use... Um, we're going to use the oyster mushrooms again, and maybe we're going to use some like Irish chicken with it. We're, we're going to, but we're going to keep it to the idea of the seaweed potato cake and the salad. And the subnatural salad will change. It will depend on what we can. I think we'll try. I think we'll try and do Friday and Saturday. So uh, and and then then we're back to normal after that. <laughs> and I think we we take one more question from this lady just here. Hi, 
you were talking about um, kind of the sanitization of food products and how that affects like our digestive system. I was just wondering, um, it's a question sometimes in Ireland about pasteurization and raw milk. Mm -hmm. oh. Just if you had any views on that in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And obviously raw milk is increasingly sort of a seen as a, um, you know, a healthy thing almost by some people and then, you know, really cracked down on by the authorities. I do, uh, I do think we just don't know, actually. We, we swung one direction, all microbes are bad. You can't swing back in the other direction, all microbes are good, because that's just obviously not true. So um, I don't think I would necessarily uh, recommend, oh, we should all advocate for d drinking raw milk. Yeah. I do think that there's a problem um, with too much hygiene and um, what's, what that's done to our digestive systems. But I don't think the solution to that is to run out and, you know, you try to give yourself food way. poisoning. <laughs> so yeah. it's, you know, it's... It, yeah. it's well, I put my cards on the table. I'm a supporter of the raw milk campaign in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just, I just maybe not to like that's that's a reasonable, I think, explanation there. But I think it's worth just also remarking that um, uh, three or four years ago, the government tried to ban the production and sale of raw milk in Ireland, and a ban, a very small ban of very dedicated people, Elizabeth Ryan, yep. um, uh, David Tierney, the late David great T David, David Tierney. Tierney. Um, uh, got together and worked very hard and got the government to turn around on it. And even if you, if you whether you agree or disagree with the production and consumption of, of raw milk, it is an ex excellent example that a small group of dedicated people can bring about real change. Yeah, it was um, so I, I'm, I'm a big supporter. Um, I don't particularly like it myself, <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean other people, people should. Option, yeah. Other people should have the the option. Well, we've served it here in the science gallery. We had um, our exhibit in 2012 was edible, mm. and I was one of the curators for the meals as part of that. And I had to create a meal that was about future nostalgia, and it was <laughs> what you thought food was going to be like as a child. You know what you thought it was mm. going to be like in the future, and I created a kind of a drink as part of the, you know, the thing, and it was hot, raw milk. Hot, fro so it was frozen hot raw milk. Okay. And we took raw milk and we infused it with chilies and we ah, okay. kind of made it really, really cold and served it as a shot. And I was a bit trepidatious at the ceremony, you know, like I was, I kind of said to everybody, you know, that it was raw milk and we got it from David Tiernan. And, and I think that People asked questions about it. They asked about, you know, kind of why it had been pasteurized in the first place, that we started a discussion about tuberculosis, about those kind of things, about what was around it. And I felt assured serving it and kind of offering it to people at a dinner because I was aware of the cleanliness of the production, that it was being tested and it was going along, that science has moved on now as well, that we, we blanket pasteurized very heavily for a long time because we wanted to eradicate certain things. And we don't need to do that anymore. I think I would tend you know, to kind of go back towards the idea of like the option should be there. And I think that people should also be reassured by the fact that we do now have a lot of, you know, kind of adequate and possibly more than adequate kind of safeguards in, in the testing of it as you're going along. Yeah, I mean, I think what you find is that um, uh, the, the Danish model around agricultural management is sort of a, a three-sale uh, approach to managing and supporting very large businesses, medium-sized businesses, and small food businesses um, is a model that we need to move towards. Yeah. Unfortunately, what we have done is we have only focused on mass food producers and mass food consumption in Ireland, and we're promoting ourselves internationally with the window dressing of our small artisans. Um, I mean, if you look at the Harvest 2020, the Department of Agriculture's white paper on the future of food production consumption in Ireland, it's lavishly illustrated with pictures of farmers' markets, <laughs> and, um, but authored by some of the biggest food conglomerates on the planet. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we really need to have a proper think about how we are approaching our, our food policy, and raw milk is, is a touchstone in that area, really. Um, and, of course, raw cheese yeah, as well and, around and that. Yeah, along with that. So, yeah. um, 
are, and even officials in the departments will accept that our legislation around food has been created for the big food market. It hasn't been created, sorry, regulations, health regulations have been created for big food production and not for small food producers. And it's easier for them to not delineate and not to look exactly. at things. It's yeah, easier yeah. to have a blanket. And yeah. I think it is important, especially, you know, the people that are coming up through, you know, the food, um, specialty food department in UCC, where I studied for a while, where it's at, they're actually looking at, you know, it's one of these strange ones, of course, it's a lot of the funding for it comes from Danone, but at least there Oops. is, I know, at least we are looking at, you know, smaller kind of specialty food production yeah. um, units there, and actually to people to stand up and advocate and, you know, and say, no, this is not going to help my business work. And like you said, with the raw milk, there's got to be sometimes people have got to stand up and shout about it. <laughs> well, um, I just I think we're I'm just looking at the, the clock here. <laughs> yeah. So we are getting towards the end of our uh, agreed time. And I just wanted to make sure if there are any other questions before we conclude. No. Oh, one more here. Yeah. Gentleman here. We've staff rushing to your aid now. <laughs> Jogging. <laughs> I should have had more raw milk this morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. A most interesting talk. Uh, Two quick questions. One is, does Nicola still have a fridge? <laughs> <laughs> and the other one would be, if uh, would the restaurants associations of Ireland, would they sort of issue a card that people could carry saying, I'm willing to take my steak tartare, my cheese chambray, <laughs> and you just you, you effectively indemnify the restaurant against it? What an absolutely brilliant idea. <laughs> yeah, <definitely. laughs> um, I really like the sound of that. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, I have a fact, fridge because you have to keep your beer cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, uh, we just uh, finish up. Um, thank um, the Science Gallery very much indeed for hosting the event uh, uh, this evening. Um, thank our guests. Maybe uh, Claire Ann would maybe tell us what, what have you got coming up in the next? Yeah, I've been so inspired by meeting Nikki and um, learning about subnatural foods that uh, towards the end of April, I'm hosting or I'm creating a dinner installation in um, uh, the gallery off Talbot Street called Art Lab and um, in there I'll be looking at more de in depth kind of look at subnatural foods and how it relates to Dublin so I'm very much looking forward where to Where will that. people find out about that? Um, if you look at um, Art Lab, um, Art Lab. On online. Okay, yep. great. And Nikki what, what have you got coming up? Well I'm working on the next e episode of Gastropod <laughs> which is all about the history and science of artificial flavours really bizarre uh, chemical history and then the genetically modified future so um, gastropod.com you can listen to that when it comes out okay great and um, just in case you're interested I have <laughs> <laughs> beautiful you segue, beautiful <laughs> segue. Um, I have a piece in the Saturday Independent on the end of the milk quotas and the great evil that powdered milk is <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you all very much thank indeed you. see you all soon